Well, it's great uh, that you've all joined us tonight and we're going to tell you uh, what a great place uh, the School of Clinical Sciences is to do your research. And this is where it is. It's just across the road from the university and we have Monash University, the Translational Research Facility, the Hudson Institute, uh, right next door to Monash Children's and Monash Medical Centre. Next slide, thanks. There's a slight delay on my slide moving <laughs> over, of course. Help. Good. So, uh, we've got this research building where we have state-of-the-art platforms, including a clinical trial centre and human imaging platform. And we've also got uh, other research platforms as well as many research centres within this building. But the important part of this location is that clinicians and basic scientists work side by side. And this is really where we can do translational research. Next slide, thanks. So we have partners with the University, the Hudson Institute and Monash Health, and we really want to deliver outstanding healthcare, education and world-class research. And importantly, all students are enrolled in Monash University via my school, the School of Clinical Sciences, but we all work together on this site. Next slide, please. The School of Clinical Sciences is big. It has eight academic departments, five research centres, and the Hudson Institute of Medical Research. And we have three disciplines only found at the School of Clinical Sciences. Uh, this is obstetrics and gynaecology, paediatrics, and molecular and translational sciences. So we, we cover the cradle to the grave. So hopefully not the grave too often. Now we have over a thousand publications a year. We have every medical discipline covered. We have a growing number of HDR students, and I think it's over 220 now. And our annual budget is $150 million. So we are big. Next slide, thanks. So um, one of the highlights is our research income, which has really grown uh, quite exponentially since 2016 to 2021. And we have a lot of success with category one Australian competitive grants. And you can see that the total research income is about $62 million now. So um, we've been very successful at attracting research income, which means we can support research projects and research students. Next slide, please. And we're also um, very good at research training. And this is shown by the popularity in uh, SCS graduate research students, which has only increased over time and now stands at uh, over 180 FSL uh, or 280 students. So it's a large number and uh, we've got an upward trend despite the disruption posed by COVID recently. Next slide, please. Now, I think what we have got that's special is having clinician scientist collaborations as a lived experience. And this is Jake Short's lab, uh, at, which shows a typical SCS research team of scientists and clinicians, which is led by a hematologist, uh, Jake on the left there. And this is true for many disciplines. And now, can a basic scientist flourish at MHTP? Well, this is Connie Wong, who I recruited from the School of Biomedical Sciences um, about uh, five years ago now. And she was successful in getting the 2019 CSL Centenary Fellowship of $1.25 million over five years, which is incredibly prestigious. And uh, she's also involved in managing our um, research high degree students. So she puts back in what she's received from SCS, and we're very proud of her as an example. Next slide, please. So we have an unlimited scope of medical and scientific domains. They're all shown here, but some of the read, leading research groups and centers are shown on the right. And that includes the Center for Inflammatory Diseases with the Rheumatology Lupus Group, Neuroinflammation Research Group, a Leukocyte Trafficking Group, and Regulatory T-Cell Therapies Research Group, which is very innovative and looking at these approaches for both immunology and cancer. We have the Monash Center for Cardiovascular Research and the Victorian Heart Institute, 
the Stroke and Aging Research Group, Behavioral Neuroscience Lab, Blood Cancer Therapeutics Laboratory, my Bone and Muscle Health Research Group, and the Ritchie Centre, which common, uh, concentrates on children's health and is a centre with the Hudson Institute. So we have research platforms, as I mentioned before, in this new building, and that includes bioinformatics, cell therapies, flow cytometry, functional genomics, histology, mass spectroscopy, medical genomics, microimaging, and the Monash Biobank, as well as an advanced bone imaging laboratory. Uh, next slide, please. So we have a huge variety of honors projects at SCS, and these are shown here. And we also have been very successful at getting the Molly Holman Award um, for um, Dr. Annie Langston Cox. And Annie is the third SCS recipient of this prestigious uh, doctoral award in the last four years. And this is for the best PhD thesis at the university. So uh, we've been, this just shows the quality of the research that's undertaken by our research students at SCS. And uh, next slide. So the other thing is that we have uh, high impact publications. And here we just have four New England Journal papers, which is pretty good. And that's all been since uh, 2020. So uh, if you want to publish in the best journals and uh, have the best supervisors, I think you should come to SCS. And we're going to hear a lot more about them uh, today. So thank you very much for listening. Hello, everyone. My name is Graham Hoglaze. I'm delighted to stand in for um, our director, um, Elizabeth Hartland, who's unable to attend today. So I'm representing the Hudson Institute, which is an independent research institute with obviously very strong links with Monash University. And in fact, many of us have joint appointments between the two. Our vision is to improve human health through groundbreaking collaborative medical research discoveries and the translation of these to real world impact. Within the Hudson Institute, we have 45 research groups consisting of about 440 staff and students. We currently have 176 students, 125 of these being PhD and 50 honours students. And you'll see that we regularly publish a number of research publications, over 250 a year. And importantly, a significant proportion of these publications have students as first author. Next slide, please. As Professor Ebling mentioned, we are located in one of Melbourne's largest scientific research and medical innovative hubs, which is a major site of um, for biomedical research translation, as well as transformative um, healthcare. And the Hudson is located just down here. And we also occupy um, rooms or floors, I should say, within the translation research facility, again, as Professor Ebling pointed out. So what do we do? Our research really spans the entire width of from discovery research through to translation, clinical trials, and importantly, into assessing the health outcomes of those clinical trials, and then implementation of those into clinical practice with the goal of delivering better health outcomes for patients. Next slide, please. Our research themes um, really span five specific areas of medical need being inflammation, reproductive health and pregnancy, infant and child health, cancer, and hormones and health. Um, next slide, please. We're also well renowned for pioneering new treatments across a number of different diseases or therapeutic approaches to human diseases. And these include cell therapies, precision medicine, immunotherapies, as, as well as microbiome medicines. And finally, the final slide, our students, we have a really fantastic group of students, a really thriving student environment, which is really led by the Hudson Institute Student Society. And their real goal is to create a positive social and academic environment which enables these students to really excel in their research degrees. The students have very regular dumpling nights and video nights and trivia nights, as well as a regular student retreat, which allows them to not only showcase their research, but as well as creating time to mix and mingle together and hopefully establish 
really strong friendships and collaborative links that will last their entire research journey. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Kate Lovelin. I'm Head of Graduate Research at the School of Clinical Sciences and I also run a research lab. Uh, ooh, that was quick. Okay, so <laughs> what will you get from your, if you choose to do your research training at our precinct? Well, I guess one of the things that is pretty obvious, you'll get a qualification that shows you're highly skilled in biomedical research, whether it's an honors degree or a master's or a PhD, and that's what we're here to discuss today. Now, some of our students are already highly qualified clinicians or uh, allied healthcare practitioners, and some are coming out from an undergraduate degree and entering honors and maybe entering uh, essentially a professional world for the first time. Whatever level you're at, you will gain some knowledge and uh, capacity for critical thinking writing and speaking. And that's because usually each discipline area has its own uh, bespoke style. And uh, there's a, another level of depth that you can go to by applying yourself and working around really smart, nice colleagues who are around to help you out. So you'll get training in these very fundamental professional areas of thinking, writing, and speaking, but you'll also get training in the state-of-the-art research platforms we heard about earlier from Professor Eveling, and you'll have you'll have hands-on exposure if that's what you like. You will also be exposed to people that are using them, and that's a great way to help you think about making discoveries and learning how to use research platforms, or maybe you'll be someone who would like to be able to build them. So there's a lot of opportunities for personal development here. Essentially, you'll be surrounded by colleagues who are devoted to improving human health and well being. So, if you're prepared for a challenge that can prepare you for the real world and also give you firsthand experience with the world of discovery and clinical research, you might want to think about doing uh, some science with us at this precinct. So, come along to um, have a look at the book if you haven't already. If we could look at the next slide, thanks. It just a, a reminder that we have a quite a broad diversity of science. You've heard that articulated already within the School of Clinical Sciences, which is where all the students enroll. You may do your research within a uh, uh, the Hudson Institute and one of the centers, or you may do it in one of the departments or centers that are listed on this slide. You really have to think about what interests you, and what skills do you want to learn and uh, do you want to acquire? Um, and you've got a lot of options here. So I would argue that what you're going to be doing is thinking, what do I want to learn more about? And if it's important to you, how do I learn to how to have an impact with my research? I think for a lot of us, that's been a motivation for a decade long career as a discovery scientist or clinical researcher practical level, you'll want to be asking yourself and your supervisors and your team that you're thinking about working with, how often will I be meeting with my supervisors? Are they available to me? Who's going to help me with my writing and present presentation skills? Who's going to teach me how to do experiments or collect and analyze data? So you'll need to speak to people in the group that you're interested in working with, and then take a go in for a visit and see how the people in interact. Do they have regular meetings? Are they are others in the team doing interesting projects? That helps make it a lot more fun for you. And finally, there's a really important practical question. What hours am I expected to attend? And what other seminars and coursework do I have to do? This is really important, particularly at the honors year where 40% of your assessment is based on uh, non-research components. But even as a PhD student, you have to negotiate with your supervisory team, and I'd suggest you do it at the start, what kind of um, work ethic or style of working is related to the actual research that you're going to be involved with. Because for some, it's quite flexible, and for others, it's not. So make sure you have the same expectations. OK, so if you want to do honors, where we, you already know, we have about 30 students working across our many different departments this year, and we've had up to 60 in the past. 
Most of the students working here are either enrolled in the BMS, the Faculty of Medicine, or the Bachelor of Science through the Faculty of Science. Both of the units have similar but slightly different entry requirements, and some students are eligible to enroll in either unit. So it has to do a bit with your own personal background, and it may have to do with your uh, grade point average, so what your marks are. All honors units, so they're very similar though. Coursework assessments comprise 40% of your final mark and the research project is 60%. So if you want to take uh, do honors, find a supervisory team with a project that interests you. You can talk to more than one, interview two or three, make sure you're polite enough to let them know you're checking around. But if there's one you're really keen on, check if that project's available go and visit and talk directly to the staff and students, and especially if you can, previous honor students. You might find a lot of them have stayed on to do a PhD. Make sure it's a good fit for your needs, your style and your background. And if you're excited, then sign up. So again, just to remind you, BMS honors enroll through the Hudson or the School of Clinical Sciences in the Faculty of Medicine and BSS, BSC honors enroll through the appropriate department or discipline. So again, that depends on your background and your ambitions. So for honors, here's the next slide, tells you the calls for enrollment take place in October through November for semester one in 2023, and in June and July for next year, if you want to enroll mid-year. And the contact names and details for the conveners and co-conveners and the honors administrator are listed here. They certainly be in the materials supplied to you, but if you wanna just jot this down, feel free. So if you've already been through honors or you're finishing your honors degree and you're thinking, oh, I might, I might like to keep going. Well, certainly you might wanna stay with the team you're working with and you might wanna to apply to do a PhD. If you're not sure and you need some more research experience, you might wanna do a master's first if you haven't already done honors. And those things all work well and we can help, help you uh, figure out where you're appropriately placed. But you need to find a team and a project that excites you. And in this case, you're committing two to four years of your, um, of your life to learning a, about a particular topic and working with a team. So make sure it's a good fit, make sure the expectations are aligned. And for this, you apply online through Monash Graduate Research Organization website. You have to complete English proficiency in research qualifications check and complete an expression of interest. So your supervisor must agree in advance to support your application. They will check your research and academic re referees. Um, and there's uh, also specific rounds if you require a living stipend or uh, for domestic students or a living stipend and a tuition payment that would be for international students and the timing of those are listed here and that information is freely available so for phd students you'll also be required to undertake some extra training different from just your research you'll take a translational research coursework and you complete two coursework units that will give you really in-depth background if you can also choose instead to take professional development modules, which are sh shorter training modules, and they give you a range of choices. So those are the opportunities for you to extend yourself as a, as a PhD student, but there, those training opportunities are also available to master student. So finally, I'd just like to mention that we do have a lot of students here. It's been growing and growing and growing. We have over 250 graduate research students and half of them are clinic clinicians or allied healthcare professionals. Um, I think that's a good sign that we have a lot of smart people that are involved in learning even more and they'll be your colleagues if you enroll here. I know Peter Ebeling, uh, Professor Ebeling boasted about our PhD students winning the top thesis excellent prize for the faculty uh, in, in the faculty in three of the past four years. And also two of our PhD students won first place in the faculty-wide three-minute thesis competition this year and last year. So we we know we're doing something right. And some of it is just because we have amazing students, but I also think it's because we have terrific supervisors. So I'll hand over now to the head of the, uh, the vice president of the School of Clinical Sciences student group, which has the name of HIS. Liam, uh, 
You've just been a little. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. Um, hopefully hearing it from the heads has already convinced you to come on board with us. Um, but I'll do my best for those of you still on the fence. I'm Liam and I'm a first year PhD student in the Stroke and Aging Research Group. And I'm here to give a bit of a student insight uh, into the MHTP. Next slide, please. Um, you could probably keep clicking through until and next as well. Yeah, that's good. Um, so it always helps to give a bit of background. So I'll run you through how I got to the MHTP. I did my Bachelor of Science at Monash where I was fortunate enough to do a third year research project that uh, then became my honours. And I know a lot of you are looking towards the MHTP for an honours project. And while I didn't do mine here, I can only say I've heard very, very good things from friends who have. And I can also mention some really important things to having a great honours. The first is find a good supervisor. They are your lifeline and your mentor, and there are plenty at the MHTP. Um, and they also sometimes buy you coffee. The people in the lab are also really important and can make life a lot easier. I was fortunate enough to have a PhD student support me in my research. She was my saving grace many times. And I see her almost every week as a friend now. Um, when I finished my honours, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do next. Being in the lab was great and I learned so much, but it wasn't for me. Imagine being vegan and then also doing small animal research. I have always liked clinical trials where you get to give the research to people. And that's how I found my current lab. While we cover things like public health and epidemiology, we're also heavily involved in clinical trials spanning from pilot studies to multi-state randomized controlled trials. My supervisors are, and I don't wanna to toot their horns too much, pretty incredible. Um, and I have supervisors from both Monash and the CSIRO. Um, they always make time for me, give me guidance and support, and are always ready to bat for me, which is so important. Um, from what I've gathered, that's kind of how people in the MHTP work. They're willing to go above and beyond to help you succeed and let you see why research is so fun. Next slide, please. Um, the research undertaken in the MHTP is so expansive from sheep cesareans to epigenetic dysregulation and cancer. There is a project for basically everyone here, whether it be wet or dry lab on the computer or taking blood from patients, which I have found is always conducive, conducive to some good twilight jokes, which they don't always get. Um, I highly recommend perusing the research project booklet to see what's on offer. Um, everyone who works here enjoys talking about their research, both students and staff. So reach out if something stands out. I'll also quickly address something really important, which is making friends. Research can be really tough, so it's important you have a network to support you. Um, students here are fortunate enough to have HIS, which organizes and hosts events, which you've heard about. Um, this spans from coffee days, networking with early career researchers, having people from industry come and talk to us about their journey and best of all, yes, dumpling night. Um, it's a great way to meet and network with people in different fields. who can also understand and empathize with wanting to scream every time your supervisor asks you to do a Western blot. Um, hopefully I've drummed up a little bit of interest and made you realize just how good it is to be a student here. And the last thing I'll say is the best thing you can do for your research is to do it somewhere that has the resources, the talent and the people to help you excel. And I can promise you the MHTP has all of those. Thank you. Thank you so much to our speakers. I guess we have time for some questions, but I know that people are quite shy at asking questions. So Angela has a question in the chat, if anyone would like to answer it, what would you say are the defining characteristics of MHTP as compared to the Alfred Research Precinct, for example? So I might start by um, answering. I am an ovarian cancer researcher. I work in the um, Translational Research Precinct here um, at Monash. And what that means is I've got a direct bridge that I walk across that's in the hospital. And it means I have direct access to the patients that I am doing my research for. Um, we have so many available resources here. Um, things that aren't available here are right across the road at Monash University. So you, you sort of have lots of things in the one place that really help facilitate your research. Um, if anyone else would like to jump in and answer. I agree with you, Marie. Um, I think the thing that we have 
that isn't present at the Alfred is this uh, involvement with women's and children's health on the same precinct. And also it is a fairly compact precinct in that um, our MHTP research is right next door to the hospital, as you said, and then the university is very close if you need to access the university researchers for any component of your project. And obviously the Alfred is a long way away from the university if you need to do that. So I think it's a great location uh, and everybody gets along really well. So there's a strong uh, collaborative team spirit, I would say is the other defining uh, factor probably for our precinct. Um, I would like to speak, this is Kate Loveland and my role gets me, that gives me the opportunity to meet supervisors and students in every single department. The, the culture of support and interdisciplinary activity is terrific here. So I guess if you're starting out and you're not exactly settled on what you want to do, it's a great way to survey the arena. There are seminars that are shared across, across many different disciplines. You can duck in and out. We have student showcase symposium. We have the three minute thesis. You have many opportunities to see what your peers are doing with completely different skill set. And I think it's it, because the culture is so enriching and, and supportive, and as you heard about from Liam, the student society is, is very proactive, very good at integrating people. And we also have a set of uh, coordinators who look after the students at a more local level. So nobody really has to sit and wonder how to solve their own problems. We actually do work quite well as a team. So I know that the people who work out the Alfred Hospital are also very nice and conscientious, but I honestly think that the breadth of our discipline is something that gives you a, a greater, a really good grounding for the real world where you have to deal with people with lots of different skills and interests. So we have Diana who has her hand up. Are you able to unmute yourself, Diana? Yes, I am. Uh, and I'd just like to reinforce, I'm Diana Edgett Warbner. I'm an emergency physician and I'm a clinician researcher. And I think that's one of the key aspects um, of the group. Um, I'd just like to em emphasize the multidisciplinary nature, but also the translation. Um, so a lot of the research um, can reach from lab to patient in a very rapid way. So if you're interested in actually doing research that I call um, passes the sort of so what test, then I think it's a great precinct to work in. Thank you. Are there any other questions? And Simon, Simon, did you want to introduce yourself? Just quickly pop your face on. I don't know if he's ready and beautiful. Simon's always beautiful. I would love to. It's very noisy where I am at the moment. But um, <laughs> yes, as, look, as the BMS Honours Coordinator at BMHTP or Hudson SCS, um, it, it is fantastic because we have so many uh, students, honours students, who actually have uh, as a uh, as their supervisors, one who is a clinician and one who is a basic scientist. And so it really does bring a lot of meaning to the projects that you work on. And, and we see that for so many of the projects that we have going on at the site. So uh, we we'll look forward to seeing all those uh, applications coming in later on. Thanks, Simon. Sorry, there was just one more question. Do most of the projects use animal models? No, not all of the projects use animal models. Um, you can choose to work with what you feel comfortable working with. Um, I know in our group in particular, we do do animal modeling, but there are some people that are not comfortable um, doing the animal modeling. So uh, we design their projects around um, what they're comfortable doing. And as Peter has um, just typed in the chat, there is a lot of clinical research. I think the real focus is um, on translating your research findings so you know getting those samples from the patients and seeing what's happening in a real-time um, situation so yeah you, you when you find as Kate said it's very important to meet with the people that will potentially be supervising you and work with them to find a project that you're comfortable doing and that you can excel at really um and we've got one more question about touching on an application project that uh, process for 
uh, student that's completed an undergraduate at a different university other than Monash. Um, Kate, could I get you to perhaps? So we, I, I've had honors students from other universities and um, you basically have to go through the honors coordinator to arrange that. It's, it's not uh, impossible at all. In fact, it's very common. My name is Susie Miller and I'm the head of the Ritchie Centre. The Ritchie Centre is Australia's preeminent research centre for studying complications that impact maternal health, uh, the health of the unborn baby, that's the fetus, or infant health. The aim of the Ritchie Centre is to improve the health and well-being of women, babies and children. And this is implemented through studies spanning basic physiology, through to clinical trials, the identification of mechanisms that underlie injury and the development of novel uh, treatment strategies. We use a, a range of different means to, um, to study women's, children's and infant health. And these range from preclinical studies using uh, animal models of compromised situations through to epidemiological studies in um, pregnant women and in uh, non-pregnant women and also babies. Uh, right through to studies in those um, populations themselves in women and babies. I'm just going to spend the next couple of minutes giving you a little teaser basically of what you of the research projects that you might find in the booklet. I urge you all to look at the Ritchie Centre booklet of student projects and you'll see listings of whether or not they might be appropriate for honours, masters or PhDs. And I'm just going to give you a little insight into the people that are the right people to touch base with if you're interested in a particular area. These people span to clinicians and uh, researchers. So just speak to as many people as you can with something that interests you. We've got studies in women's health, in genomics, diagnostics and novel targets for endometriosis. We study endometrial organoids. We study bioengineered materials and stem cells for pelvic, pelvic organ prolapse, which is a significant complication and problem in women's health. We study many aspects of pregnancy, both normal, pregnant, normal pregnancy and what happens when things go wrong in pregnancy too. We really um, have a, a really in-depth research program looking at trying to reduce, reduce stillbirth rates in Victoria. And we've had success in this area, which has been really impressive led by Dr. Miranda, Miranda Tavis, uh, Davies Tuck, sorry. We're looking at new therapies for preeclampsia. And we also are really interested in placental structure and function and how this can impact pregnancy. And also what it tells us about the pregnancy. What are the clues that it provides us about the health of that pregnancy? Next slide, please, Marie. We've got studies in newborn infants and Rosemary touched on uh, preterm babies, but we've study a whole range of, um, of complications and situations in newborn infants, exploring the cardiovascular system of the infant at birth. When is the optimum time to clamp the umbilical cord? These are being led, led by Stuart Hooper and Graham Polways, who you heard speak earlier. We're studying the transition to lung breathing at birth and some really neat imaging strategies to look at the lungs at birth using the synchrotron, both here and in Japan as well. We also look at the effects of asphyxia at birth. What happens when something goes wrong during birth and the baby doesn't get enough oxygen? And if you're a particularly small baby, does this complicate this, this situation? With regards to preterm birth, there's a, a very wide variety of studies that you might be interested in, particularly looking the, at the immune system of the premature infant, which we know is impacted by preterm birth. And you could speak to one of the knolls about those projects. We're looking at a novel anti-inflammatory approaches for babies that are born preterm. And we look at preventing uh, preterm brain injury and the progression of preterm -pre brain injury by targeting inflammatory cytokines. And this is being done in both preclinical animal models to look at the mechanisms of injury, also in a clinical trial that's running at the moment led by one of our fabulous PhD students. Finally, we've got quite a large program looking at um, stem cells and a variety of different stem cells, ranging from um, stem cells obtained from the placenta or the umbilical cord, like umbilical cord blood or mesenchymal stem cells, through to exosomes and, um, and their effects. You can study these in preterm babies, or you can study them in other complications of health. And I think that's it for me.
Thank you. Hello, I'm Kate Loveland. I'm also the head of the Center for Reproductive Health, and I also head a research group studying testis development in male germ cell biology. So I think most of us know that none of us would have been here if a sperm and an egg hadn't come together to start formation of an embryo. Well, our research is investigating this absolutely um, remarkable, but also um, mandatory event for life to occur. What many of us are just learning about is how important environmental exposures are in utero to determining what adult reproductive health will be. So um, in our center, we actually have a really broad spectrum of projects that are looking at the real nuts and bolts of how sperm form properly, uh, what happens, how does the uterus form, and how does the uterus become receptive to allow an embryo implant. But we're looking in great depth at the fundamental research issues that are arising now in our discipline that are trying to understand why the rates of infertility are increasing worldwide. Why is the male sperm count declining? Why is the incidence of testicular germ cell tumors, cryptorchidism and hypospadias, uh, dysgenesis that, if, that arise from in utero events? Why are these increasing? So a lot of our work is focused on trying to understand the mechanisms that are involved in that but we also have to go back and study the fundamental events that are required for normal research. I have a PhD student who just finished her uh, thesis and submitted last month, looking at the description of the immune cells that are arising during different stages of fetal testis development and looking at the factors that regulate that. And in Mark Hedger's lab, he has students who are looking at the impact of disruptions to uh, the immune system and how they influence male, um, adult male uh, fertility. So we have a broad range of, of uh, projects and uh, supervisors working on diverse areas. We do use you know, the very high-end single cell transcripto, spatial transcriptomics, mass spec, spectrometry, imaging, proteomics, et cetera. But really our focus is on the questions of trying to understand the fundamental principles of cell and organ health in order to provide evidence that can be then applied to improve the health care and, and provide tools that protect fertility. So we have a strong interest in training the next generation of research and healthcare pr practitioners by providing the evidence that is needed to protect reproductive health. So on the next slide, I've just listed a few of the projects. Um, in the top right corner, there's a picture of some uh, of some of our students. I think they're all, oh, one's still a student, uh, a couple still students in there. Um, several have graduated or handed in their thesis by now. But we have a, a, the giant knitted placenta that came to visit our institute. Uh, another feature that you'll probably uh, not find in any other research precinct. Uh, I've listed three of the projects on offer that I think highlight the, the breadth of areas that we're interested in, and hopefully one of them will interest you. So Associate Professor Robin Hobbs is an internationally renowned for his work on spermatogonial stem cells, and Dr. Eileen Chan is a senior researcher in his lab that are trying to recruit a student who might help with their work on trying to understand how chemotherapy treatments that men have to undergo at different times of life to treat a, a tumor, for example, have the uh, how they can protect the spermatogonial stem cells so that they can recover. And those men or boys who were, uh, the men who were boys when they had their treatment can recover. So recover and sustain fertility. So the methods for that project may include the spermatogonial stem cell cultures that are really highly, um, highly sophisticated, immunofluorescence and different kinds of transcript analyses. So please contact Robin if you're interested in that type of project. 
He's a very kind and energetic person who has a, a tremendous track record. So there's a new combination here, Dr. Neil Youngson and Harriet Fitzgerald. And this project may not be listed in the book yet, but I know it's going on to Supervisor Connect. Neil has an expertise in epigenetic mechanisms and reproduction, and he has been, uh, he's developed a new project with a student who graduated from the Center for Reproductive Health uh, years ago and, and went and did an overseas postdoc and is now back working in the department of ONG, Dr. Harriet Fitzgerald. And they're interested in developing human endometrial organoid cultures to look at how um, the impact of DNA damage proteins and epigenetic analyses will give them clues as to the increasing risk of endometrial cancer. So that should be a, quite an exciting honors project. Um, please contact Neil if you're interested in that. So in another area entirely, Professor Nutzat Ahmed, who is based uh, predominantly at Federation University in Ballarat, but also has a research base here in the Institute, partnering with Ruth Escalona, who is a recently submitted her thesis, PhD thesis, has a really interesting project on ovarian cancer progression, chemo resistance, that is looking at a specific uh, signaling molecule called magmas and looking at it in the context of using cell lines, xenograph mouse models, and phosphoproteome analyses. So she's really keen to, to use this to develop new, um, new strategies for uh, clinical management of, of uh, ovarian cancer. And she has very strong clinical contacts uh, in her work in, in, the, in Ballarat. So please contact Nutsat if you're interested in hers. Um, again, if anybody's interested in research and reproductive health, please contact me or any one of our team members. We'd love to meet you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Jacqueline Pearson, and I am representing the Centre for Innate Immunity and Infectious Diseases, or CIIID as we call it, <clears throat> and we are embedded within the Hudson Institute. So um, at CIIID, we discover and model how early immune responses or the innate immune response regulates disease, and we translate our findings into practical outcomes that impact on relevant global health issues. So inflammation is a really central theme at CIIID, as I've put it up here in the middle. It underpins hundreds of health conditions, and it contributes to more than 50% of deaths worldwide and an escalating burden of disease. And the COVID-19 pandemic alone has really illustrated to the world how important inflammation research is and will remain. So the immune response is important in every disease you'll study as a scientist or a doctor. A successful innate immune response can resolve infectious diseases and eliminate cancer, whereas a poorly regulated immune response causes chronic inflammatory diseases with multi-organ impact. So at CIIID, we're made up of 12 labs with around 120 staff and around 47 of those are students. And as so you can see here, I've put it um, students based at the, the bottom of this pyramid, and I really think this is because great students underpin our great work at CIIID. So um, we are world leaders in research on um, innate immunity, um, and, and we uh, can boast that we're Australia's largest team of innate immunity researchers under one roof, and we are really are internationally renowned for our expertise and, and being this hub of innate immunity. We perform high quality discovery research using the latest technologies and we translate our research into preventions, diagnostics and treatments, and we publish in the world's top impact journals. So what I've got listed here, and this is from the website, so if you go to the Hudson website and you click on inflammation, you will see these areas that we work on. So they are broad. Um, 
as you can see, we work on um, uh, microbial aspects of innate immunity, so antimicrobial resistance. We work on gastroenteritis and microbiome in health and disease. So I'm personally a microbiologist, so I focus on gastroenteritis and antimicrobial resistance. But we also have world leaders in areas such as inflammation and cancer. So we're looking at stomach cancer, ovarian cancer. Um, we have a lot of labs that work uh, in chronic inflammatory disorders, such as inflammatory bowel disease. So we have clinician researchers leading those teams. We have um, experienced virologists working on uh, co aspects of COVID-19, inflammation, influenza, and also teams working on inflammatory disorders, including lupus and pneumonia. So we have this really broad range of research, but what's great about the CIIID is that a lot of these teams work together. So we collaborate with each other and we also collaborate across different centers within uh, SCS and within Hudson Institute. So it's a really fantastic place for collaborative research because we do that very basic research that underpins multiple either inflammatory disorders or infectious diseases. Next slide, please. So before I just finish off on this slide, um, if you, you can notice that down the bottom of the slide there, I've got a link to a podcast that uh, the CEO of Hudson did on inflammation. So if you wanted to copy that and have a listen, it's a really, really good podcast to listen to. It gets you very excited about the kind of research we all do. And my name and email is there in case anyone wants to personally contact me about specific uh, projects within CIIID. So our main focus is to perform top quality discovery based research discovery based research is really what we do. Um, and we also look to look towards developing treatments to prevent or alleviate inflammation driven diseases. We have research projects with impact and so we're working on really current things that are important globally COVID-19 flu cancer obesity diabetes IBD. Um, gastroenteritis, lupus, um, COPD, and we have a lot of clinical researchers, ones that lead groups and ones that work within groups as well. And I've put here skills, skills, skills. We have, uh, you'll learn a lot of skills within this center. So anything from molecular biology, signal transduction, protein interaction, cell biology, immunology, we have a great hub of people that um, work in microbiology. So we have bacteriologists, we have virologists, and that's quite unique to the CIIID. We have our own building, we have a lot of facilities around being specifically being microbiologists. And also we have structural biologists. And if you're not one of those people who likes to work at the bench, we also have labs that do functional genomics and bioinformatics and contribute greatly to research projects. So we have a lot of experienced supervisors that have produced top quality students um, of our 12 labs, four of them are female lab heads. So if some people feel more comfortable with a female lab head, we have really great female lab heads. You get really great hands-on supervision at CIIID and a lot of time in the lab, um, which is really exciting. We really focus on your career development. So looking at your CV, giving great presentations, getting your writing up to scratch. And we're a very inclusive and diverse department. So you're really looking at getting a lot of cross-disciplinary training at CIIID um, and really contributing to translational research and commercial engagement. So you can see a bunch of happy students here from CIIID. And um, just to finish off, I'm going to just mention that we have one of our lab heads, Associate Professor Michael Gontier, has very recently partnered with, with industry and he is developing the next generation of anti-inflammatory molecules to blunt toxic inflammation in severe COVID or flu or autoimmune disorders. And some of his research has already led to a phase one cl clinical trial in COVID-19 patients. So we're really having that impact in the clinic as well as doing great uh, basic research. So feel free to contact me. We're a very open, friendly department and we look forward to hearing from you. Hello everyone, uh, my name's Jason Kane. I'm a research group head in the Centre for Cancer Research. Uh, and within the Centre, the center we undertake uh, discovery research, uh, translational research, as well as clinical research. And really the, the overriding goal of all of the research programs in our centre is to understand uh, underlying cancer biology so that we can identify new, uh, more effective uh, and safer therapies. Uh, and in order to do this, we have or we utilise a, a large range of cutting edge uh, technologies, uh, some of which are highlighted on this slide. Uh, and this includes phenotypic imaging uh, of both um, tumour cells and the tumours uh, as, a, as a, a bulk. Uh, we have a very large functional genomics uh, program uh, utilising uh, CRISPR uh, 
genome editing. Uh, and within the centre, we have uh, a number of really exciting resources, uh, which include a whole genome, whole genome arrayed uh, guide RNA libraries. We also have a number of pooled um, uh, CRISPR libraries as well that are specific uh, for various um, uh, aspects of biology, whether it be uh, whole genome, epigenetics, uh, kinases. Uh, we also have uh, quite a large uh, high throughput drug screening program or capability using robotics. Uh, and we have about five different uh, commercial drug libraries, um, which total uh, probably about 3000 different drugs that are either FDA approved uh, or in late stage clinical trials. And that's not just for cancer. These are also for other diseases, uh, but we can repurpose these drugs for, for cancer. Uh, and we also utilize a lot of next generation sequencing uh, techniques, whether that's looking at mutations within tumors, looking at gene expression, looking at epigenetics or other techniques uh, that we introduce into the department uh, as needed. Uh, we're also very strong at modeling uh, cancer in animal models. Uh, we have uh, many different uh, types of, of animal models of cancer, whether they're uh, genetically uh, modified mouse models, uh, patient-derived xenograph models, uh, and we have both immunocompetent and immunocompromised uh, mouth mo mouse models uh, of different cancers as well. We also have a lot of expertise in proteomics uh, as well as gene therapy. Uh, a lot of the work we do uh, in the center involves uh, cancer cells. So we do a lot of work in the lab um, uh, growing cells in the incubator and on plastic and doing experiments with those. Uh, we're also interested in cancer biomarker development, uh, transcriptomics, uh, and of course, immuno-oncology is um, really a growing field uh, within uh, cancer research and, and cancer therapy. And also we have expertise in structural biology and cryo-M. Next slide, thank you. So this, this is just a, a brief summary of the, the main labs within the Centre for Cancer Research and the lab heads. So I won't go into a lot of detail about what each of these labs do. Uh, you can look up these lab heads either on the website or within the uh, student booklets. Uh, but what they work on, uh, I'll just briefly summarise. So uh, Ron is uh, particularly interested in childhood cancer as well as gastrointestinal cancer. Uh, my lab is almost entirely um, interested in, in uh, paediatric or childhood cancers, but we do also work a little bit in lung cancer. Dan Goff's lab uh, is primarily interested in um, stat cancer biology, and he mostly applies that uh, to small cell lung cancer. Uh, Catherine works on both adult and paediatric or childhood leukemias. Uh, Chun Hua is gastrointestinal cancer. Uh, George and Jim uh, work on hematological disorders, which include cancer. Uh, and then Andrew and Marie uh, both have uh, large programs in ovarian cancer. And then lastly, Wilson, um, who is a structural biologist, utilizes a number of different cancers depending on the questions uh, that he's willing to ask. So as you can see, uh, there's a broad range of, of research uh, diseases or cancers within the center. Uh, and we apply uh, many of those cutting edged uh, techniques to all of our research programs uh, in, in different combinations. So if you're interested in any of the diseases or the techniques, uh, then please get in touch with any of the individual uh, research groups. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Vincent Harley, and I'm a molecular biologist and geneticist in the Centre for Endocrinology and Metabolism. Uh, which is the leading Australian centre for clinical endocrinology and endocrine research. Um, we're closely aligned with the endocrinology unit of the hospital, Monash Health, uh, which is Victoria's largest health service. Uh, we are six research groups and um, unusually four of us are clinicians running both clinical and laboratory based research. And so it's, it spans discovery, translational, clinical and population research. And of course, we have um, vacancies for vacation honours, master's, PhD students in areas from science, to informatics and medicine. Um, and we take students from Monash, uh, Deakin and University of Melbourne. Next slide, please. The six group uh, areas and heads are firstly an endocrine hypertension, Dr. Jun Yang. And her main question is, um, what is the prevalence of primary aldosteronism and how can we improve diagnosis and treatment? And so her, her lab 
does everything from bench um, and, and models all the way through to population health. Um, the aim being to identify biomarkers uh, to improve diagnosis and treatment. Uh, my lab is the sex development lab. I'm interested in sex differences in common diseases, as well as in very specific um, gender-based diseases, such as intersex conditions and transsex conditions. Um, and my areas are principally gynal, um, developmental biology and genetics. And we also look at sex bias in diseases such as Parkinson's and more recently autism. Um, Rob McLaughlin uh, runs the Clinical Andrology Lab and his questions are around sperm production and how it's regulated and how it fails, leading to infertility in males, um, running, um, uh, trying to get at the genetic causes of infertility uh, and also around assisted reproduction. Um, Francis Mallatt is interested in bone uh, research and principally how how can we prevent osteoporosis and fractures in young adults with chronic disease? Um, and she looks at a whole range of diseases, um, uh, cerebral palsy, spina bifida, thalassemias, pregnancy, related bone disorders, kidney and liver disease, and looking at the, um, the consequences to bone and how to improve bone health. Um, the hormone cancer therapeutics group uh, is led by Dr. Simon Chu, and he is developing uh, drugs uh, to improve um, outcomes and direct um, treatments towards ovarian cancer principally and also thyroid cancer. And our um, the center head, uh, Professor Peter Fuller, is focused on um, steroid receptor biology, asking uh, specifically the mineralocorticoid receptor and how it acts in classic and, and non-classical um, tissues. So uh, yeah, we're studying a, you know hormones and their complex action through a whole range of organ systems from and, and studying from um, genetics through to uh, biochemistry, structural biology, um, translational uh, drug development and animal models through to human um, population um, studies, meta-analysis, and um, some um, clinical trial work as well. And so if these areas uh, or any of them interest uh, you, uh, please contact us. Our Instagram and Twitter is uh, are at CEM underscore Hudson, um, and, or you can contact me or any of the other uh, lab heads if you have any interest. Thank you. Thank you so much for sparing your time um, this evening to hear about some of the wonderful projects that we have on offer here at the MHTP. I think you can sense the enthusiasm from most of um, the speakers that spoke today. And um, we're really thankful for these potential um, supervisors for taking the time to share their enthusiasm towards their projects. Um, and in particular, I'd like to thank the first set of speakers who bared with me while I learned to drive PowerPoint remotely. It just shows how kind and caring your potential supervisors can be. Um, if there are any questions, please feel free to pop them into the chat. Um, I can read them out or likewise, um, feel free to just contact us afterwards. Uh, the contact details for um, the school's are available in the email that was sent to you with this um, student open day link. I might just wait and see if anyone has any questions. Well, in terms of contact with supervisor, I think the best thing for me is you introduce yourself and why you're interested and what they can offer you. So, you know, I've read about your project. I have a particular interest in this particular disease. Um, I'm looking for a project that's going to enable me to you know, broaden my um, scientific diversity, I guess, and put into practice some of the, the, um, the stuff that I learn at university. Um, and, and what do you have on offer? And I think it's really important, you know, you can get a really good vibe when you start talking to someone and see, but it's the most, we always say to all of our potential students, it's probably the most intense year that you'll have as a researcher because you learn so much um, and you put so much into practice so it's really important to just have a, a good connection with the people that will be supervising you 
did you want to answer that question, Kate? Are there any prerequisites or units that you have to do to um, get into uh, any of these projects? So at, at an honours level, clearly to enrol in your specific um, program, you do have prerequisites. So, you know, you wouldn't take somebody from from a arts degree into a science honours project, right? So you have to check with the honours coordinator, absolutely. Um, they're pretty fluid, so the, the, there's a will to give people the benefit of the doubt, but you just have to demonstrate you have a suitable background for masters and PhD, obviously, it's a bit more rigorously scrutinized because it's a bigger commu commitment on both sides. And um, I think it was also in relation to if you were interested in psychiatry, did you have to do psychology as a unit? I'm right. not sure Rachel might be yeah. able to. No, you don't have to do psychology. So we do a lot of neuroscience um, projects. Um, so if you have a, a, a science background, even it's molecular biology, or physiology or anatomy, um, that's perfectly fine. Uh, there was one good question here. If there are two project leaders in a study that you're interested, should you contact both? Likely event is that one supervisor will be the one that replies and the other isn't. So you can copy them both into um, the email that you're sending um, when you're trying to contact them. So, um, and again, don't, don't just reach out to one person spread yourself around, have a look at what we have on offer. Everyone is clearly very enthusiastic about their work, but it's also about you finding the right fit for your um, research career. So um, scholarships on offer for people that are doing masters instead of honours. Um, I know that there are yes. scholarships yes. for regional students, um, but in terms mm -hmm. of straight yeah. up, Research masters is available, if but you wouldn't get a research masters uh, candidature unless you already had done some. You, unless you you wouldn't be likely to get a scholarship unless you had already done research because the scholarships are so competitive. Um, if anybody has specific questions about that, you can send me an email and we can talk about it. But the. PhD in honors scholarships, uh, PhD in uh, master scholarships are highly competitive through the university. Typically, people who already have a research background or get really high marks from their honors are likely to secure them. If you're going to do a master's as your first degree, uh, it, the university is unlikely to supply it through its usual route, but your supervisor may have avenues for supporting you and it never hurts to ask. They may have some part-time work that would help keep you going if you needed money for fuel. And it's also a great way to pick up some uh, transferable skills. Thank you, Kate. Well, we have finished slightly early. Again, I'm sure that you'll have questions that pop into your head. Everyone is relatively approachable here, as you can tell. So um, feel free to send emails. And there are also links within the email that you got um, from for this actual event. So thanks, everyone, for your time. And we hope you have a great evening.